Hi, everybody. I'm Al Bernstein, Showtime Boxing Analyst, and I listen to the Ringside Boxing Show. Live from Monterey on California's beautiful Central Coast, this is the Ringside Boxing Show. I'm Dennis Taylor welcoming you to join me and my expert analysts, Travis Hartman, Rizwan Zahid, and John J. Responsi today and every week for the hottest, sweatiest show on the West Coast. And now, from Studio 1A, it's the Ringside Boxing Show. Hey, welcome to the Ringside Boxing Show on the Grueling 2 Sports Network. I'm Dennis Taylor, and we've got some excellent stuff for you today, a lot to talk about. In the 1940s and 1950s, professional boxing was ruled with an iron fist by some very frightening people, murderers and thugs like Frankie Carbo, who murdered 19 people, and Blinky Palermo, who was a notorious Philadelphia numbers runner, and various other gangsters and weasels. Um, in those days, you had to play ball with them or you weren't likely to get a meaningful fight, let alone a title fight. If you didn't play ball, you might get your skull fractured by somebody with a lead pipe, which is exactly what happened to Ray Arcel, the Hall of Famer who trained Benny Leonard and Ezra Charles and Jim Braddock and Mar- Barney Ross, Tony Zale, multiple others during the golden era of the sport. So in a little while, John Responti and I will be talking to Jeffrey Sussman, author of a brand new book, called Boxing and the Mob, The Notorious History of the Sweet Science. And if you are a junkie of boxing history or gangster history or both, this is going to be a treat for you. And that's coming up shortly. We're also going to hear from Paul McLaughlin, our British correspondent, who's got some more stuff for us from the United Kingdom boxing scene about Anthony Joshua and Joe Joyce. And believe it or not, come back chatter from Carl Frosch, and we'll kick it off with a look at the Canelo alvarez Danny Jacobs fight and a lot of other stuff from uh, our expert analyst. Travis Hartman is a professional boxer, trainer, and promoter from Osborne, Missouri. He's now living and training in Orlando, Florida. Rizwan Zahid, a boxing journalist from Toronto, and John J. Responti is chief lead writer for MaxBoxing.com and Doghouse Boxing, and John and I are co-authors of Intimate Warfare, the true story of the Arturo Gatti and Mickey Ward Boxing Trilogy. So, um, hey guys, we all waited with great anticipation for the fight between Canelo Alvarez and Daniel Jacobs. Scorecards were very close. Canelo won a unanimous decision, 115-113 twice, and 116-112. But the general consensus seems to be that Jacobs kind of blew an opportunity. Some of the criticisms were that he didn't show the same kind of movement that we saw in the Golovkin fight. He let Canelo control the range. He, He didn't work the body very much. It, and he kind of turned it into a dull fight. Jacobs said afterwards that he had trouble finding his rhythm and gave Canelo some credit for that part and also for some defense. And he also said that he needs to consider whether he wants to go up and wait because 160 isn't comfortable for him anymore. So let's find out what you guys saw. Riz, break it down for us. What what, uh, what fight did you see? I saw Canelo have a great start, as he usually does uh, in most fights. Uh, this has always been a Canelo strategy. Um he knows he's a he, – he's always tended to fade later in fights, but he does in such a way where he builds a solid lead. And even the, you know, the rounds that he's faded, he, he strategically pot shots and, and, has, and has improved his defense and his footwork where he can pot shot and still win a round with expending very minimal energy. Obviously, he can't do that for 12 rounds, but he can do it in the late rounds to still um, you know, make sure he's not just giving, out, you know, giving away every single round. Um, and that's what we saw yesterday. Um, you know, there's there's at times and flashes where he looked, Canelo uh, that is looked brilliant. His defense was obviously on point, but I really have no idea what Danny Jacobs' strategy was last night. Uh, I'm I'm looking at this and I'm seeing he's standing right in front of Canelo, and that's exactly where Canelo wants you to be. He doesn't want you to be boxing and moving. Um, you know what Austin Trout did, what Lara did, and hell, what probably Glovkin did in 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 a lot of the second fight as, as well. Who, who was you know working off the jab, and if mm-hmm. you're comparing. You know, the, the reason people were intrigued by this fight because they thought that Danny Jacobs and, and what he did against um, Golovkin would be somewhat similar, uh, you know, in terms of at least Canelo and Golovkin are somewhat similar styles and, and similar, um, uh, you know, physical body structures. And, and Jacobs would, you know, move on his feet and jab and move. And he did that maybe the first round. After that, I really have no idea what his strategy was. He was standing right in front of Canelo expecting to just jab and ladder right hand. And it just, that, that made no sense to me. So, I mean, I know it wasn't that long ago, but I've, it seems almost as Daniel Jacobs has 
he really looked his his full age last night. Where against you know against Golovkin, even though it was a couple years ago, I saw him move a lot more. And obviously, there's some credit to you know Canelo for making him miss and, and do that. But again, I just have no idea what the strategy was. That the strategy, you know, Canelo has. If there's one flaw Canelo has is he's never been great at cutting off the ring. So you make him cut off the ring by boxing and moving your legs. But um, I don't know. I, I know it was only like it was only two years since the Golovkin fight, but um, I don't. I don't. I, I was really disappointed with Danny Jacobs because even in you know the last four rounds of that fight um, with Canelo having a pretty big lead on the scorecards, um, you know, in round nine, Danny Jacobs landed a massive left hand. And, you know, everyone, you know, obviously Canelo could take a pretty good shot. And we all saw him take that shot. But, you know, Canelo didn't throw another punch for another 30 seconds. He was coming forward to try to, um, you know, act as if he wasn't hurt or stunned by it. Uh, but Danny Jacobs didn't follow up at all. And I just, again, I don't understand what the what the strategy was at all for this fight. And, and even, you know, from that, there's just no urgency. And I think, you know, reading his comments after the fight, he said, well, I thought I did enough to win. Well, we've seen Canelo. I mean, at this point, you know Canelo is going to get the benefit from every scorecard. Like, I mean, that's just you know, there's three three guarantees in life: the death, taxes, and a favorable Canelo scorecard. And I'm not saying he he didn't deserve to win last night, but you know, Danny Jacobs probably should have known heading in that he's not going to you know he's not going to get a win if a lot of the rounds are close. I mean, that just uh, I think we all would have thought that. Um, but we thought I think we thought though he would at least understand that and fight with the sense of urgency that would allow him to put some of the, you know, the rounds that were questionable, leave no doubt in the judge's mind and the viewer's mind that he won those rounds. And he did, he simply didn't do that. Um, you know, the 115, 113, I think is very fair uh, of a scorecard. Um, you know, mm-hmm. I've seen some as, as close as a draw, which is, I mean, that's just kind of how the fight broke down. Again, we, we have a recency bias of, of remembering what rounds, you know, kind of happen, but people kind of forget the first round, the second round. Um, but overall, I, yeah, I was, I was honestly very disappointed with Dan Jacobs because that fight was there for the taking. I, I don't think, you know, I don't think Canelo thought he boxed a beautiful fight or anything like that either. I mean, there was elements and flashes of Canelo's brilliance in the first half of the fight, but in the last half, I mean, he was, he was very underwhelming. He was, you know, he was breathing pretty hard and, I mean, he had a pretty comfortable lead. And again, Danny Jacobs, Danny Jacobs did nothing to press him and take it away from him. He just, uh, I don't know, he just kind of went about a business and didn't move his feet much and it didn't box at all. Um, I don't know. I thought, you know, if, 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 if this was the performance that he did against Golovkin a couple of years ago, that was, you know, that would have been a one-sided fight. But I think we expected the, the Jacobs who fought against Golovkin, at least in that style, um, to show up last night, and, and he simply didn't. And I don't know, his, 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 he had a very laissez-faire attitude and just saying that, you know, no, I thought I did enough to win. But, I mean, we all knew that wasn't going to be enough, right? I mean, uh, when, you, when Canelo in pretty much every fight has had one crazy favorable judge. So, um, you know, fair or not, that's not even all we're discussing. But, I mean, it's, you know, it's home court advantage like it is in, in you know, basketball playoffs or any other sport. So it's, you know, you're you're the underdog, and if you have to fight like that, he didn't fight like the underdog. I think um, Travis and I were talking yesterday. I feel like he almost fought as if he was Canelo, and and figured he was going to get favorable scores. There were just there was no sense of urgency, and that was that was disappointing because Jacobs has never fought um, that relaxed and laissez faire before, and it's uh, you know especially in a fight that was really there for the taking, especially in the last couple rounds. You know, in the last three rounds. Um, you would think that the way the fight was going, the way Dan Jacobs landed that right, that left hand, and 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 Canelo not really doing much at all in that ninth. You would think that last three rounds Jacobs should have won, should have went out there and won all three rounds because I, I really think he could have. I don't think there was much Canelo had left in the tank to really prevent him from doing that. But Canelo's not a stupid fighter. He understood when to pot shot and move out of the way and and probably. So I think out of those three rounds, Canelo won one, if not maybe two of them. And that maybe secured him the fight. Um, so uh, overall, I'd say uh, you know Canelo did his job, but Danny Jacobs simply didn't because after that, that fight was there for the taking. And I think that was a very underwhelming, very surprisingly underwhelming performance from Jacobs because that fight that, that could have been a W for him for sure. Travis Hartman yeah. joining us from some sun splashed uh, Florida beach right now. Uh, Travis, uh, <laughs> what, what, what could Jacobs have done differently last night to win this fight? Yeah, see, I actually I disagree with Riz. I think that Daniel Jacobs fought uh, 
the best fight that he possibly could fight because I, I had it 116-112, which is eight rounds to four, but I easily could have seen seven rounds to five, which means that that was one round away from being a draw. And that was with one of the greatest fighters right now in, in this in this time frame, which is Canelo Alvarez. He's, I think we all can consider him up there, you know, top three, top four, pound for pound. So I think he fought a, a, the best fight that he possibly could fight. And I think we saw a different Daniel Jacobs than we saw with Triple G because Triple G is a different style. Triple G doesn't make you miss like Canelo did. Canelo, to me, his defense, again, the past two to three years post Mayweather, Canelo's defense has been phenomenal. He made Daniel Jacobs miss so many times uh, last night that I was just like, wow. I thought Daniel, I remember there was one exchange with about four or five punches that Daniel Jacobs let his hands go, and literally every single one of them missed Canelo. So I think Daniel Jacobs was trying, and I think we saw all the best Daniel Jacobs. I just think Canelo's that great, guys. His defense was that phenomenal. His, his offense was, I thought Canelo's offense wasn't what we're used to seeing. I didn't really think he let his hands go as much as normal, but I thought Daniel Jacobs did the best he could, if that makes sense. If he, he didn't, I thought his, his game plan was good, and when you come that close, in my mind, he was one round away from getting a draw with easily um, the best top five pounds per pound right now, which is kind of obvious. He was one round away from getting a draw, so I think that's phenomenal. That's phenomenal, because Daniel Jacobs tried. He tried to press, he tried to throw punches, but Canelo's that good. His defense was that good, and to me, that's what was impressive, and that's why I think Canelo won that fight again was because his defense, the way he was flipping and moving and his timing, it was impressive to me. And I, like I said, I scored it eight rounds to four. I thought Canelo was very impressive, um, but I easily could have seen a 115-113, which two of the judges scored. I thought the judges' scorecards were on point. There was two 115-113 and one 116-112. And I scored at 116-112. But everybody on the show knows that I usually do score because I like his style. I like how he fights. He's in and out, makes people miss, and it's kind of underwhelming for most. But for the most part, I do favor Canelo in a lot of fights because of his style. And last night was no different. I think he's that good. He is. I knew he wasn't going to knock out Jacobs because Jacobs was a mammoth. I mean, you're, Jacobs was a light heavyweight last night, guys. He was a light heavyweight. That was 175. He was 173 and a half fighting a middleweight in, in Canelo, and Canelo has moved up from 147 to 154, two middle weight. So he was fighting a light heavyweight out there. So I was happy with the performance last night. I thought it was good. I thought Jacobs did as best as he could. But I just thought Canelo was that much better. And that's why Canelo is Canelo Alvarez, because he fights like that. He's smart. He's intelligent. He's crafty. And he showed us that last night. Uh, John, the article, the headline on Max Boxing says it's, uh, it was more of a chess match than a slugfest, which is pretty darn accurate. Um, Golovkin said it was boring with no drama. Canelo said he thought it would be much more entertaining. Um, did the fight disappoint you? And if so, who gets the blame? Yeah, in a way it did. I mean, I I, I agree with I, – it's funny. I agree with both guys in a, in, in a sense. I like the, the technical aspect of Canelo as a, as a, as a, a guy who writes about boxing and has and written about him and watched him for years. He has improved so much. He – yeah, he doesn't cut off the ring very well, like Riz said, but in, in all other areas, he's in his peak right now. He's fast, and, and I thought I, – I, I agree, though. I thought that Jacobs was going to go for it a little bit more, and, and he said – he did say, I think I read somewhere, that, that his corner was telling him that he was winning the fight. I didn't hear that. I, he, hmm. he asked uh, Rozier a couple of times what he thought. Did he win around? He went, ah, it was close, so I didn't get the feeling that – Somebody was saying, "Look, you're winning coast." I, I, but he was also being told to be careful. So it, it was. I think, in a way, I think Jacobs was a little confused in what to do because I remember before the fight they weren't sure what style Canelo was going to uh, fly. Was he going to be moving away a little bit like he did against Golovkin, or is he going to be in the second fight going forward? I actually didn't think it was a really big shocking thing. I thought he was going to do both, but he was aggressive and he was that Canelo. And he, his defense, uh, Travis said that, and I said, I think Riz did too, his defense, he's very quick, you know, very fast, and he, he bobs and weaves and, and, and dodges and parries and does all that stuff, and he just improved in, in so many ways. Um, you know what they say, Dennis, styles make fights, and, and we thought going in that with these two guys' styles that it would be much, there would be much more action, but 
there wasn't, there wasn't. I mean, in the first half of the fight, it was mostly Canelo, and then Jacob started coming on a little bit. Now, if he had fought like that in the beginning, uh, well, we don't know exactly because Canelo had more going than he had because he was pretty gassed by the 10th round. But it was just it was just one of those deals where it didn't work out like we thought. You know, we thought it was going to be – I did. I think most people thought it was going to be more exciting where, where it turned out to be more tactical, which which was okay too. But when you have an expectation going in, it could be, it could be disappointing. So I found myself uh, disappointed at times, but also ad- ad- admiring of – uh, some of Canelo's talent, but Jacobs, you know, the only, the, the thing that I agree with Riz on is that he didn't fight like he was really hungry to win. That was the thing. Now, you know, easy to say that sitting here on the couch when you're fighting a guy who, who hits as hard as Canelo, but I, I thought he was going to be, I thought he would take more chances. He took a few, but it, it might've been the old thing, Dennis, where sometimes guys bring in so much respect that they, they don't go for it like you think. It was like we were saying about Golovkin. You know, why wasn't Golovkin going to the body against Canelo? Well, he was worried about what was coming back at him. So Jacob stood toe-to-toe a few times, but he really didn't seem too anxious to do that. And he got hit with a few solid shots, but he took them fine. And he nailed he nailed Canelo with a good shot. Canelo, I think Canelo was a little buzzed, but he, he's so stoic, you know, he's a little stone-faced. But, uh, yeah, Jacob's weighed... 170 something well i'm sure canelo weighed 170 something so they were they were close as far as that goes but um yeah i i thought when this fight was made i thought it had the potential of being one of the best fights of the year and boy was i wrong on that one so a good win for canelo but if i'm danny jacob i'm disappointed in myself a little bit and rogier even said to him look we don't want to go home and and wonder if we we did all we could do to win. See, and I think that was really honest on his part. He was telling him, "Look, okay, you're 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 competitive. You're coming on a little bit, but I think you can do a little bit more." And he did, and he didn't, and he didn't, and he knew about Canelo's record as a with judges. He said, "Danny Jacobs said, look, I know, I know that. I I know I'm going to have to do more to win rounds. I'm going to have to knock him out." So it wasn't like he wasn't aware of all this stuff. So, you know, I think you, you, you throw that all in the mix, spin it around, mix it up a little bit, put it in the blender, and you had all these things going in Danny Jacobs' head. And it might be one of those things a week from now, Dennis, he's sitting there going, God dang it, that fight was there. I, I was in yeah. it. I was coming on. If I had done a little bit more, a fight fought with a little bit more urgency, I could have won it. Uh, and I, I think yeah. that would be an honest, uh, uh, honest thought on his pro, on, 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 for him. Okay, so guys, who could beat Canelo? I noticed Billy Joe Saunders never seems to come up when Oscar De La Hoya starts talking about possible opponents. Um, Oscar mm-hmm. last night mentioned Kovalev, uh, who's getting long in the mm-hmm. tooth, but he's man, he's uh, uh, he'd be a T Rex in the same ring with a middleweight like Canelo. Um, Oscar mentioned Callum Smith, who's 168, uh, and there's also uh, Gilberto Ramirez and Demetrius Andrade, who seems to be in the picture there. Uh, Charlo is a young lion. Um, Riz, which which fighters are a really bad idea for Canelo Alvarez at this point, and and who's a good one? I mean, all these names you mentioned, realistic, we're not going to see any of those. Um, you know, if there's a certain network problem or anything like that, I don't think we're gonna we're gonna see it. There's no way, you know, no one really thinks in this uh, like Roberto Ramirez is anything special. And there's no way top rank is gonna put him in with Canelo. Um, there's no way, you know, uh, even though to be honest, I think Canelo can beat Kovalev. As funny as that sounds, really? Um, wow. Yeah, well, I just think I just think uh, you know, Kovalev's not young. I really don't know. Yeah. Uh, we we really don't know anything about the Alexia Alvarez win and loss yet. It's going to take a couple of years before we look back on that. Um, you know, I've seen Oledia Alvarez, uh, you know, in person, and he's a he's massive. He's a massive person, but he's been underwhelming at times. And, and I think against, you know, in the first Canelo fight, he just landed a hammer at the right time. Um, but, you know, uh, Kovalev's not young. And if someone's able to, like, out, you know, land him and outquick him, that's, you know, that's that's an under award thing, right? So, I mean, and again, I don't think we're going to see it at all. It's just, you know, that's that's something they're throwing out there. Um, you know, Billy Joe Saunders, it seems like he's moved up permanently to super middleweight. Billy Joe Saunders is <laughs> definitely a guy when, when, it, when it actually matters, 
he puts it together. And the problem is, though, no one trusts you to put it, put it together for a big fight until you put it together for the smaller fights, right? When you're, you know, missing weight and getting in trouble and there's stupid videos of, of you out there, it's hard to trust you, and especially when you're already kind of a, you know, because I'll, I'll say this right now, Billy Joe Saunders is the worst thing for Canelo. Um, and I'm not saying yeah, Canelo won't beat I him. I'm not, saying he can, I'm not saying he can't beat him, but sure. stylistically, he's horrible. He, he is the worst thing that could Canelo, that Canelo could face um, because he's not small yep. either. Where a lot of, you know, if you remember against Arizlan Nilar, Arizlan Nilar is not really a big dude. Um, Saunders easily walks around probably 180 pounds. And he has the slickness and the, and, the, and the boxing IQ of someone significantly better. But again, um, you know, that, you're not going to see that. You're not going to see, um, you know, uh, there's rival networks that play. There's, you know, rival promotions and all that stuff. But, you know, I was there in person watching. I know, I know David Lemieux is a completely different fighter. But watching Billy Joe Saunders absolutely school David Lemieux was actually a thing of beauty. Like, it was, it was, it was jaw-dropping a little bit. Like, he, the mm-hmm. space he created. But... Um, again, I don't think we're going to see that. I don't think you're going to see Caleb Smith either against um, against Canelo. I think um, you know Caleb Smith is another guy who who puts on you know a good amount of weight, and I just don't see you know why would why would they risk that? You know what I mean? And and you know the Charler brothers again, different network altogether. Um, but you know Caleb Smith, I think would be a very difficult fight because Caleb Smith is again massive fighter. He's six three. You know people thought Jacobs had a size advantage on Canelo. Uh, you know, Caleb Smith would have a much bigger size advantage, and he, obviously he's not a he's not a, he's not Rocky Fielding, right? He's uh, you know he's he's he you know he he fought Rocky Fielding. I'm pretty sure he knocked him on the first round. Um, so he, he's a you know and he's he's just a massive fighter. Um, so at this point, it seems like one way, shape, or form, um, we're going to see on Demetrius Andre and Golovkin um, one or the other first. Um, I think if they don't choose Golovkin first, it's going to, even, even though I don't think, I, to be honest, I don't, I don't think the, the, the outcome is going to be in doubt. Uh, Glove, you know, switching trainers or not, Golovkin to me has just looked significantly older the last couple of years. And obviously Canelo is just entering his, pretty much his physical prime. Um, you know, so it's, it's, we kind of knew this before the first fight. That's why they waited that long. We knew that before the second fight. Obviously the third fight, they're going to do the same thing. Um, Demetrius Andre could potentially be a rough match for Canelo. I don't think he's accurate enough or smart enough as a fighter, though. I think he's a great athlete, but I don't think his IQ is the way Billy Joe Saunders is. Uh, you know, you got to remember, Demetrius yeah. Saunders just moved up to middleweight. Billy Joe Saunders has moved up to super middleweight, and has campaigned as super middleweight even before that. Um, so Billy Joe Saunders, with his size and his slick ability, is, I think, much worse than Demetrius Saunders is. Demetrius Saunders, I think that fight would be more similar to the Lara fight. But that being said, if most people, a lot of people had seven to five last night for Canelo, um, and and, less, and we were all saying Jacobs, at least, you know, we're, we're, there's some commonality of us saying that Jacobs didn't fight as well as he could have or should have. Um, you know, Demetrius Andre could potentially pose a stylistic matchup problem with Canelo, and, and uh, Travis can probably speak on this a little more. I think when you're used to fighting one style over and over, at least to some extent, like, you know, Daniel Jacobs is not the slickest boxer, and obviously, you know, there was, uh, there was Golovkin. Um, it's going to be hard to just switch it up and fight a guy who's completely different. Uh, but that being said, we talked about Dimitri Sandre before. Man, that guy's a boring fighter. <laughs> he, he is a boring fighter who hasn't, uh, who hasn't ever really impressed either because, you know, the guy, the, when we look at slick boxers, we look at them for dominance. And if you're a slick boxer who's winning, uh, you know, fights 7-5, to 8-4, to four, that's not that impressive either. So, um, I don't know. I, I wouldn't be surprised if that's the next fight. Um, Canelo should still win because, uh, frankly, I haven't really ever seen anything from Andre that I thought was great. But that being said, mm-hmm. Styles make fights, and maybe he, maybe you know, th- that's the thing. When everyone's kind of gunning for you, when people are going to fight a Canelo, I don't think they're going to take that opportunity lightly, and I think they would put it all together. But that being said, that's what I thought about Daniel Jacobs last night, and. I hope, I hope if Andre fights Canelo, I won't be disappointed by an effort and a performance. Travis, yeah. go for it. You sound like you got a lot to say here. Uh, no, I mean, I actually, I mean, I agree. I think that, uh, I think Canelo will end up fighting Andrade next, in my opinion, and probably September, and then and Cinco de Mayo weekend again, but this year he'll fight Triple G. That's my opinion because I think the biggest fight always happens in May. Oh, Mayweather used to fight the biggest fights in May. 
now now Canelo's kind of taken over that date because he's a Mexican, so I don't think he's going to fight Triple G until uh, next year, to be honest. But mm-hmm. there's a name that they really haven't talked about that's been thrown in that mix, and it's a crazy one. It's Errol Spence for Canelo. There's Whoa. Been crazy rumors. There's been some crazy rumors that Errol Spence has talked about that and has actually wanted to fight Canelo. And if that fight happens, oh, my God, it would be awesome. But I, I'll pick that's Canelo. Delicious. But Yep. But it is, right, though? It's it's a fun fight for guys like us because we're like, that's a throwback. That's a guy like Errol Spence just wanting to fight anybody and everybody. And I had a, I appreciate that. So that's a crazy name that's kind of been on the on the low end of the radar, like low-key, but I've heard it. And if that fight ever happens, I mean, that would be massive as well, you know? And that could be a fight that could derail a, a, a Crawford versus Errol Spence fight as well. So I, I want it to happen, but then I don't. And then I'm just like, whatever happens, happens, because that's a delicious fight, like you said. Then it's like, that's, I would love to see that fight. Yeah. Canelo versus an Errol Spence. Because, I mean, honestly, Canelo's a middleweight, guys, but we all know that he moved up. I mean, he's, he, you could tell that everybody that he's been in the ring with since he's been a middleweight, that Canelo is, is, has a distinct size advantage, uh, disadvantage. He's always looked, he looks a little bit smaller, a little bit shorter. So I think that if he fought a guy like Daryl Spence, I don't think the size of Andrew would be that huge because Canelo's not a uh, massive middleweight as it is. So it's it's a fun thought, I guess, but more realistically, I think he's going to fight Andrade. I really do. And Andrade is a slick uh, lefty, and he's very athletic, like Joe said, but I don't think he <laughs> has the intelligence and the, and the ring IQ uh, to beat a Canelo. So I think Canelo would breathe through a guy like Andrade. And I also just don't think that Canelo is going to fight Triple G next because he just came off of a massive fight. I mean, Danny Jacobs, all of us, we all said it. We were like, that's a, that's a great fight. I can't believe that Canelo picked to fight him on, you know, his second fight on the huge contract. That's a risky fight. And by all means, we even last night, all of us said it. You guys said it tonight. Like, he could have won that fight. Daniel Jacobs could have done just a little more to win that fight. I just don't think Canelo let him do a little more is why. But I, I think that... Canelo's got a lot of opponents in front of him, and I 100% agree with Rick is I'm going to go Billy Joe Saunders. Billy Joe Saunders, and I said this, and I say this about Tyson Fury yep. in the same way, their styles, they don't match up well with anybody because they're slick, crafty, a little bit awkward. And I honestly, that's the one fight that I don't think Canelo should take because I think Billy Joe Saunders in all, in all realistic avenues, Billy Joe Saunders could be him. If Billy Joe Saunders brings it all together mentally, physically, and everything, and we say that about Tyson Fury as well, if Tyson Fury is mentally and physically prepared, he can beat anybody. Same thing with Billy Joe. I'm not even kidding. If that guy is mentally and physically prepared, I think he has the style and the craftiness and the awkwardness to beat a Canelo. So that's why I think they will not take that fight for a while. Travis, uh, would, would Oscar have the nerve to make a Kovalev fight, and it, where do you come down on that? Would would Canelo beat Kovalev at 175? You know what? I'm agree with Riz again, which I don't agree with Riz a lot, but I'm gonna agree with him. Kovalev <laughs> versus Canelo would be just David Goliath looking stuff, but I think Canelo would win too because of his defense wow. and his how quick and how fast he is. But I mean, I don't. It's crazy because I'm a fighter and I, I kind of want the best for fighters, but. Uh, a dangerous and a windy. Oh, did we lose Travis? So big. Oh, no, you're still there. Okay, go, go ahead. Yeah, we might we may have lost him. John, what about Jacobs? Is this a guy on on a downslide, or could he rejuvenate himself at 168, where the opponents are bigger and stronger, but where he also is not going to have the weight loss battle that, that he seems to be having right now? I think he's on the downside, Dennis. I do. We had discussed uh, 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 coming up to this fight with Canelo that he hadn't looked very impressive in his last few fights, and and he he, he was inconsistent. You know, there was something missing in his last few fights, and and I think it was just that you just start to go you're you're a little over the hill, just a little bit, and that's the thing you notice. Obviously, he wouldn't agree. I mean, he's only 32 years old. Uh, he he hasn't had a lot of fights. Uh, but he did have a big fight uh, nine years ago with cancer and beat it, which is an incredible story and it's incredible for him. He, and, and, and the thing about Daniel Jacobs is he's one of these guys that you pull for all the time because uh, 
uh, I've talked to him before, and he's one of the nicest guys in the world, and 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 he's a, he's great for the sport and everything. But uh, unfortunately, I do believe that he's starting to go down, and he will move up, I think, because he, he'll feel like cutting weight and getting down to 160 really diminished him in a sense. But I don't think it's just that. I think uh, he will try to move up to 168, not try and do it. And and uh, he's got the frame. It looks like in a way to handle 168, but he's going to be fighting bigger guys and stronger guys. And, and he can beat most guys, but he's going to have the same issue when he, when he uh, uh, fights the top guys. Now him against Callum, Callum Smith would be a very intriguing fight. Cause as uh, uh, Riz was saying, I think Callum is such a big guy, you know, six, three, somehow he gets down to 168. Uh, that would be intriguing, but uh, I don't see why not. I mean, he might as well try it. But I do think that he's, as my friend Rick Glazer likes to say, he's on the, the back nine right now. Maybe not on the 18th hole of the back nine, but probably on the 11th or 12th as his career is going. So it's just one of those deals. Some guys can do do better uh, with their career, last longer. But he just it, it's just been kind of a theme his last few fights, Dennis, where it's just been a little bit instead of going up. It's just been going a little bit down. And that might have showed itself, too, last night a little bit with his lack of movement like I was expecting. I, I really thought he would use the ring more. And they always say that the fighter's legs are the first thing to go. Now, I don't think they're gone, obviously. I don't want to exaggerate here. But just a little bit in boxing. It doesn't take much. And you lose a little bit of that, and, and you, you just can't you can't recapture it. And, and, and so why not move up to 168, see what happens. Hopefully he isn't complaining about the decision. I thought the decision was fair. I also uh, wanted to say that I had it 116 to 112 for Canelo, even though obviously 115 to 113, I could see that. But uh, I thought Canelo won the fight. So uh, why not move up to super middleweight, see what happens? Uh, Hey, you know what? The the second biggest story of the week, I guess, is that Golovkin is now with Jonathan Banks, who's the former cruiserweight champion and uh, was previously – he previously trained – Vladimir Klitschko and Dillian White. Um, Riz, Oscar seems to consider GGG just another face in the crowd at, at this point. Um, can, can Jonathan Banks uh, make a difference for Golovkin? Uh, it's, it's honestly really hard to say. I mean, I just, at this age, I, don't, I wouldn't think so. Um, you know, a guy who's in his late 30s is not really going to be all that different um, or acquire new skills, but... I'll say this, with Golovkin's history as a fighter, you know, in his amateur background and all that, there's probably so many things stored in that boxing brain of his that he hasn't channeled in maybe 10 years that, that maybe Jonathan Banks can bring back a little bit. Um, you know, Jonathan Banks, uh, you know, if we're looking at how we how we worked with Klitschko, he didn't completely rework his style or anything like that after Emmanuel Stewart's that sudden passing. Um, but he 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 perfected it maybe a little bit. He'd add a little more finesse, but uh, I mean, all than that, he just, he was there to, um, you know, fine tune a couple things, but that's pretty much it. He wasn't trying to, you know, he wasn't trying to rewrite the wheel here. Um, but what I do think is, you know, understanding uh, if there's one commonality that Golovkin has right now, which, which Klitschko had was that both guys were in their late thirties pretty much. Um, when, when Jonathan Banks stepped in. So maybe it's a little more with the training methods. Um, you know, if I, if we look at big bear, and what, what Golovkin was doing, he was still doing a lot of road work. Now, I just turned 30, and my knees are already shot, and they're pain any time I do any road work. So for a guy who's at that level, um, you know, that's, that's, it, takes, it takes a lot of toll uh, on, on a guy's joints. And that's why Klitschko, over the last, you know, seven or eight years, his cardio was just through swimming. Um, and, and, again, it's just that understanding of, you know, I mean, obviously Klitschko is a, you know, not forget a brilliant boxer, but he's a brilliant man. He's a PhD in sports medicine, so he's not, you know, he's not your average fighter. But, you know, Jonathan Banks, I think, might do these kind of things to understand longevity of training, um, you know, because I, I, I wonder I wonder what, you know, what Golovkin's training schedule was like in Big Bear. I feel like I, I never heard of any, you know, easy kind of training in Big Bear, if that makes sense. I think, you know, I think at this point it's more, you know, Golovkin's going to come in shape. He's never, he's not a guy who, packs on 20 pounds in between in between fights or anything like that so none of that stuff is really gonna affect him too much what i wonder is how they're gonna you know maybe adjust his training so he's able to get the most amount out of his training without being depleted at all and have the highest amount of energy 
Um, unfortunately, you know, his next fight is not really going to be indicated of that, I don't think. Um, you know, Rose is a solid fighter. He's a Canadian boy, local guy. Um, but, you know, I mean, he's been kind of gunning for a big, uh, you know, a decent fight for a while, but he kind of went from zero to 100 here. Um, but, you know, it's good for him. He's stepping in and taking that opportunity. Um, but I don't know. I, I think, unfortunately, I mean, we all know five of the times undefeated. No matter who your trainer is and all that, it doesn't really make a difference. So unless Golovkin ends up fighting Canelo in September, if he's going to wait another year for that fight to happen again, it just, it's just this a strategy of aging a fighter is just ludicrous to me. It's just, uh, you know, just fight or don't. That's it. it it's, it's not, well, we'll see in a couple of, Like, that's just nonsense to me. Um, because, you know, you're never – we saw in the first two fights, I mean, I still think that Golovkin won both fights, um, but the second fight, not nearly by as much, and I don't think the third fight is going to be any different. So when this fight was supposed to happen four or five years ago, I think most of us kind of expected one result, and that was Golovkin to win. Um, so uh, any, any longer he waits, he's getting to his late 30s while Canelo just entered his physical prime. And that's just a recipe for disaster. I'm not saying, you know, like just to allude to what John said, a glove is also on his back nine. Um, but, you know, I don't know. Right now, I don't know if he's on 11 or if he's on 16. And maybe he's actually just trying to get Canelo on 18 and he wants to, you know, he wants to pull a tiger and just win on that final hole and then call it call it a day. Um, so I, I, I think for Golovkin at this point, I was surprised that he signed kind of a long fight contract. Um, you know, I think at this point, Golovkin doesn't really care too much about the whole titles and, and all that, which is kind of what he's done the most of his career. I wouldn't be surprised if he takes on the quote unquote bigger fights. Um, but you know, yeah, I think at this point, I don't think, I don't think Jonathan Banks can do much. I think the best thing Jonathan Banks is going to do is just manage his training schedule better. Um, you're not going to teach Golovkin really new tricks, I think, at this point. But you might try to get him out of boredom. Uh, you might just have him focus on, um, you know, just uh, agility and, and and joint pain prevention and all those sort of things. And just I think it'll be I think it'll be more just training smart, not hard, if that makes sense. Okay, uh, Travis, are you still with us? I guess we lost Travis. Okay, uh, John, uh, we also learned last week that Andy Ruiz uh, won the sweepstakes to replace Big Baby Miller as the opponent for Anthony Joshua on June 1. Uh, Ruiz isn't much to look at. He's, he's a fat heavyweight, but this guy's 32-1 and one with 21 knockouts. He was 105-5 and five and five as an amateur. He's got some skills, and he's, he's deceptively pretty quick, and he's got uh, wins over uh, guys like Alexander Dimitrenko and Kevin Johnson. His loss came in 2016 to Joseph Parker, um, who who only won that fight by majority decision in New Zealand, Parker's whole, homeland. Under the circumstances, was was there a better choice for Joshua um, at this point than Andy Ruiz? And is there any uh, any reason to think Ruiz could be a problem for Joshua? Well, let me let me I'll answer that in a second, Dennis. I do did want to announce though that it looks very good that we will have Jonathan Banks on uh, next week as our oh, wow. headline. So we we will be able to ask him all those questions we want to ask about Triple G, uh, what he can do, what he won't do, what he can tweak, what he won't tweak. Because there's a few things he could do, and Triple G complimented him last night and said that he's already. I'm sure Abel Sanchez groaned when he heard it that he's already learned a few things from Jonathan that he didn't necessarily know before. Yeah. So, uh, but Triple G was was classy like always, but he got booed mercifully over there at T-Mobile, which was very interesting. But yeah, so uh, that hopefully uh, looks very good that we're going to be talking to Jonathan Banks in a few days. So can't wait to do that. Uh, Andy Ruiz has got some skills. You know, he's a he's a clever heavyweight. He hits pretty hard. He's he's kind of sneaky. So it's possible that he could clock Joshua if he hangs in. But there were some other choices. But I, you know, considering what happened with Big Baby, I don't think it's it's a bad thing because who knows who he could have put him in there. There were a couple other names bandied about, and, and one of them was a was an English heavyweight, and, and there was some thought that Eddie Hearn would push him, and he didn't, so maybe Eddie knows something that we don't know. Um, but I, I think Joshua won't have a problem with him. But uh, Ruiz does do little things that uh, Joshua isn't the fastest guy in the world, and he might be able to sneak something in. Uh, but he's he's going to have to he's going to here we go with one more with Danny Jacobs he's going to have to fight with a real sense of urgency and take some really heavy shots to 
to do something because he's not a guy that fights that way. When he fought Joseph Parker in New Zealand, he sh- a lot of people thought he won that fight. I didn't. I thought Parker edged him, but that was a case where if he had done a little bit more and and fought with a little more hunger, and a lot of people would make fun of him with that one because it doesn't seem like he's hungry. <laughs> he eats pretty well, but just did a little bit more, he might have got the decision. Now, it would have been very hard to get a decision there in New Zealand, but maybe just do a little more every round. That would be what, you know, I would think I would tell him if, if I was somebody that could do that. Go, Look, just do your normal thing, but just do a little bit more and a little bit more just to try to impress the judges. But in this case, uh, it, it's obviously an uphill battle. But uh, Ruiz says, like I said, Ruiz, and, you know, let's be honest, Josh was not a great fighter, and he's been buzzed a few times. So things happen. Uh, Joshua should win, but you know, it's not it's not the worst matchup they could have made on, on, on such short notice. All right, that's Travis Hartman, Rizwan Zahid, John J. Responti. Travis, enjoy the beach. Uh, John, you enjoy your concert later on today, and uh, Riz, enjoy those infamous Toronto uh, traffic snarls. All right, you guys have a great week. <laughs> All right. Take care. All right. All right. And on one coming up. I'm not the one to complain, Mr. Weffley, but I thought you said no what stuff. I'm Dennis Taylor, co-author of the Amazon bestseller Inima Warfare, the true story of the Arturo Gatti and Mickey Ward boxing trilogy. You know, writing this book was a labor of love for John J. Responti and myself. We enjoyed every minute of the process and considered it a privilege to tell the tale of one of the most electrifying boxing trilogies in the history of this sport. Inima Warfare traces the collision course of Arturo Gatti and Mickey Ward from their earliest days through their three epic fights as well as the aftermath of this great rivalry, which culminated in one of the greatest friendships in boxing. Inima Warfare has received a four and a half star rating from readers and was endorsed by Hall of Famers Harold Letterman and Joe Cortez and two-time trainer of the year Virgil Hunter. Our foreword was written by Ray Boom Boom Mancini, another one of the greatest blood and guts fighters of our time. Get your copy today at Amazon.com. Hi there, it's Paul McLaughlin with your weekly roundup of everything going on in the UK boxing scene at the moment. Well, Anthony Joshua is seeking a spectacular knockout of Andy Ruiz Jr. to stay on course for a mega fight against Deontay Wilder or Tyson Fury. The unified champion defends his world heavyweight titles against replacement opponent Ruiz on his US debut at Madison Square Garden in New York on the 1st of June after original challenger Jarrell Miller failed a drug test. Joshua respects the threat posed by Ruiz Jr., pointing to his refined skills and dangerous power, with the Californian-based Mexican attempting to ruin ambitious plans for an undisputed title fight with WBC world champion Wilder or an all British battle with Fury. However, AJ isn't happy with Ruiz already getting involved in trash talk. He's already started this trash talk. <laughs> you don't want to talk because this is very old. I will whoop him. You know, I, I thought he's a cool guy. Do you know what I mean? I said, I got in there and I just beat him up slowly. But if he talks reckless, I will bat him. Like, I'll show him what this robot can do. So it's up to him how he wants to approach the fight. If he wants to talk reckless, then he'll be in for a proper scrap. You can't push these buttons. I'll punish him. Bad. Elsewhere, Commonwealth heavyweight champion Joe Joyce will fight the six foot seven inch Russian veteran Alexander Ustinov this month in preparation for his British title fight against Daniel Dubois in July. The Olympic silver medalist Joyce will take on the 42 year old on the undercard of Billy Joe Saunders' WBO interim super middleweight world title bout against Germany's Shefat Isufi in Stevenage on the 18th of May. Joyce has won his eight professional bouts by knockout. Ustinov has won 34 of his 37 fights, 25 by knockout. Joyce won the WBA gold title in his last fight against former world champion Bermain Stavern in February. And finally, Carl Frosch, yes, Carl Frosch, has refused to rule out making a comeback 
after reports linked him with a third fight with George Groves. The former three-time super middleweight world champion retired after claiming a second straight stoppage win over Groves in 2014, while his bitter rival hung up his gloves in January. So, what's uh, Frosch got to say about this? I don't think he'll have it, but if he if he wants it, 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 it does a million miles for me. He had a bad shoulder, didn't he, in his last um, in his last fight? I mean, I know Callum Smith's not taking anything away from him. I think uh, I think he had to be one seventy five. No, probably one seventy five would be the lowest. I don't think he'd even met one seventy five. Really? Yeah, I'm not giving him stick. I'm all right at catch weight. I don't mind giving him a few pound away. Yeah. Yeah. Right, that's your lot from me, guys. I'll be back next week with some more boxing news. In the meantime, gloves up and protect yourselves at all times. Back to the studio. Thank you, Paul McLaughlin. Well done, as always. Uh, we will be talking about gangsters and boxing in our next segment with author Jeffrey Sussman. You guys are going to like this. We'll see you in another minute. If you like the Ringside Boxing Show, you're going to love the website ringsideboxingshow.com Hi, I'm Dennis Taylor, host of the Ringside Boxing Show, where since 2008 we have been continuously sponsored by Garcia Boxing, the first family of the sweet science on California's beautiful Central Coast. Trainers Max and Sam Garcia and ring strategist Dean Hamilton are regarded among the most knowledgeable in the game. And Kathy Garcia, who manages all Garcia boxing fighters, is renowned for her integrity and career guidance, having taken two boxers to number one world rankings. Together they comprise one of the most respected teams in the sport. Learn more by calling 831-261-3214 or send them an email at GarciaBoxing25 at AOL.com. Hey, we also want to wish uh, good luck to Garcia F Boxing's uh, star fighter right now, Ruben Villa the Fourth, Dracula, who you will see on Showtime on uh, Friday night. Uh, he's going to be in the main event. Uh, he's 15 and 0, and uh, very exciting fighter. Uh, was uh, uh, I, I think he won 15 national championships as an amateur. Uh, so something to check out. You discover this kid, Ruben Villa the Fourth. All right, uh, let's, uh, let's get on with our main event right now. You guys are going to enjoy this. Uh, this is Jeffrey Sussman, um, who is the author of Boxing and the Mob. There was a very direct dealing between mob guy and fighter. In those days, the mob guys held a special place they no longer hold. And so a certain amount of reverence built up around them. Now you take a fighter who really, particularly in those days, I mean, you're not going to see too many Harvard and Yale fellows entering that business. It's very hard to get hit all the time. Uh, these were kids, tough kids who needed the money, who, who saw it as a way out of the particular ghetto that they were involved in, and the mob was a natural for them. Welcome back to the Ringside Boxing Show on the Grueling Truth Sports Network. I'm Dennis Taylor with John J. Responte, and we are really excited about today's featured guest. Jeffrey Sussman is the author of, I think, about 13 nonfiction books, including Max Bear and Barney Ross and uh, Rocky Graziano, Fist, Fame, and Fortune. Uh, he was on our show to talk about that book uh, not, uh, probably a couple of years ago. His latest work is called Boxing in the Mob, The Notorious History of the Sweet Science, which will be released, I think, Wednesday by Roman and Littlefield. So by the time you hear this, it might even already be out. Um, and that's the same company that, that published the book that John and I wrote, Intimate Warfare, The True Story of the Arturo Gatti and Mickey Ward Boxing Trilogy. Boxing in the Mob is already getting raves from reviewers who received an advanced copy, and I'm going to give it another one right here. I read it this week, and it is fascinating. It's one of the, uh, one of the many things I, I, I really loved about it was that Jeffrey Sussman put together a, a lot of smaller individual biographies and, and weaved together stories of a whole bunch of badass gangsters and snakes and quite literally Damon Runyon characters. And Jeffrey, you, you put them all together in a really seamless narrative that's a whole bunch of fun to read. And if you happen to be a junkie of true stories about seedy underworld thugs and nasty, greedy, heartless, uh, sociopathic, uh, bastard grifters, <laughs> um, <laughs> as I am and as John is, oh, yeah. people are going to love this book. So congrats, you've done it again. How you been, man? I've been very well, thank you, and I appreciate the fine words you just said about my book. <laughs> well, yeah, it's real I, and pleasure. I second, I second that. I second that, Jeffrey. I got to read a lot of your book too, and it, it's excellent. Super thank you. Job. 
And, you know, as, as authors ourselves, we're always curious about why a topic was chosen, but you, you explain a little bit about that in the intro to the book. Tell our audience about your great uncle Irving. Yeah, um, I met him only once when I was uh, 13 years old. My father introduced me to him, and he handed me a, a wad of money, um, which I was surprised about uh, getting from him. And I never uh, saw him again, but uh, um, afterwards I asked my father about him, and he said that uh, during the Depression, uh, well, my father's family was rather poor during the Depression, and Irving had made a ton of money as a bootlegger, uh, during Prohibition, and had a big estate uh, in upstate New York next to the governor's mansion. And my father visited him on two occasions, and uh, he wouldn't uh, give any financial aid to my father's family, but what he did do is he, he would give him advice on which boxing matches to bet on that were fixed. Uh, a number of them were, were matches with uh, Primo Carnera. And, and my father said to me, he said, uh, well, bet $75 on this match, and you'll walk away with either 750 or $1,000. And he did that uh, uh, several times a year. <laughs> wow. <laughs> oh, man. Man. Well, Boxing in the Mob is, is uh, a journey through American boxing history, I'll call it, and it, it also American mobster history, um, essentially from the time of Jack Dempsey to uh, through the Sonny Liston era. And, and most fans are at least peripherally familiar with the Black Sox scandal when a gambler fixed the 1919 World Series. Um, what they might not know is that the guy who rigged the series that year uh, moved on to even uglier things. Um, he essentially gave birth to organized crime in this country, and along the way he also corrupted professional boxing in a pretty fa profound way. Give us a feel for who Arnold Rothstein was and also who Abe Attell was. Um, and, and how those guys changed the sweet science for, for decades. Well, uh, Arnold Rothstein w w was a brilliant uh, mind. He, he was known as the brain and the big bankroll. Uh, he was able to put together all sorts of uh, schemes and devices, to, uh, that all, all of which were illegal, to make a lot of money. And he became the mentor of the, me uh, of the men who really organized crime in America in the 20th century. He mentored as a group, uh, Bugsy Siegel, Meyer Lansky, Lucky Luciano, and Frank Costello, all of whom were, were boyhood friends. And he taught them everything that they needed to know about uh, how to organize crime and, 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 and corrupt basically whatever they got involved in. Now, Abe Attell, who had been the featherweight boxing champion, I believe it was from 1906 to 1912, became a friend of uh, Arnold Rothstein, and, and was sort of his bag man. Uh, it, was, it was from Arnold Rothstein that Abe Attell got money to, to bribe the, uh, uh, what were called the Black Sox players uh, in throwing the 1919 World Series. But then after that event, uh, especially because of all the negative publicity they got, Abe Attell and Arnold Rothstein realized it would be a lot easier to corrupt boxing and fix a boxing match than a baseball game because there were just a lot fewer players that you had to bribe and depend upon. Mm. Mm. Interesting. Hey, Damian Runyon, the legendary American writer and sports writer and playwright, is a reoccurring character uh, in your book. Explain why, Jeffrey. Well, uh, uh, Damian Runyon uh, loved uh, the underworld. He loved these characters, and he got very involved as, as, as a friend of first Arnold Rothstein, he, he was a friend of Abe Attell. He, he, he knew all these gangsters uh, uh, from uh, the, the 1920s and the 1930s. And, and his, uh, the famous play, Guys and Dolls, which he was responsible mm -hmm. for, is, is based on all of these uh, real-life uh, gangster characters. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, uh, l let's see. Uh, Dave the Dude. Um, who, who was Dave the Dude uh, model on? Uh, I, I, I think Dave the Dude was, uh, I'm trying to remember now, uh, but, but I know that Nathan Detroit w was uh, to some extent based on Arnold Rothstein. Uh, yeah. and, and, and he was the big gambler, and, and, and Arnold Rothstein was the big gambler. Um, I can't recall exactly w which character Dave the Dude was based on. It might have been Oni Madden. 
Did that's that right. Oh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think you're right about that. I think it was Oni Madden. Hmm. Okay. And, and um, Oni Madden was, was an interesting character. He came from from England uh, uh, and settled on the west side of Manhattan in what was then called Hell's Kitchen and associated with, with Irish, Irish gangsters and, and, and made a fortune uh, during Prohibition. And after Prohibition, he was looking around for a, another way to make money. And he came across uh, Primo Carnera, who had been brought to this country uh, by a French uh, boxing manager whose last name was C, S-E-E. And mm. he basically took uh, Primo Carnera away from him and wound up fixing all of Carnera's fights. And, and Carnera didn't even know his fights were being fixed. He thought he was actually w winning these bouts. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, wow. uh, yeah, J John is a is a big uh, movie historian and stuff, and I, I know uh, one of John's favorite movies is uh, The Harder They Fall. Which right, yeah. based on, 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 on Primo Carnera. On Primo. What, what a lot yeah. of people uh, don't know about Oni Madden is after he retired from, from, the, uh, from being a mobster, he settled in Hot Springs, Arkansas, and he opened a kind of a resort for retiring uh, mobsters and mobsters on the lam. And in his last years, he became quite ill. And the nurse that took care of him every day was uh, Bill Clinton's mother. Mm. <laughs> Man, wow, that is the <laughs> So the, the, fam the famous Hollywood actor George Raft, who usually played a gangster, um, was a guy who kind of wandered through the underworld uh, and the boxing world and the entertainment world all at the same time. And you've got a great story in your book, one that I hadn't heard before, about James Cagney and Raft. And, and this weasel Oni Madden, who, who created basically created Primo Carnero, or had a big or Carnera and had a big uh, role in it at least. Uh, explain what happened to Cagney and how George Raft and Oni Madden figured in. Well, uh, Raft started out as a protege of, of Oni Madden, and and when Oni Madden uh, ran a New York gang called the Gophers, uh, George Raft, who, whose real last name was Ranft. Uh, you used to go up onto the uh, roofs of, of uh, tenement buildings with Oni Madden and throw bricks down on the cops um, and, 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 and loved Oni Madden and wanted to be a, uh, a gangster like Oni Madden. And, and he kind of uh, wandered into, into show business almost by accident. He, he was a, a dancing gigolo, and, <laughs> and, and, and that was pretty much how he made his money. Yeah. And... and, and movie career just happened accidentally but uh, while he was in Hollywood uh, he, he befriended uh, James Cagney who played gangsters in so many movies and uh, for some reason there was a contract out on, uh, on, on, on Cagney's life and he was terrified mm. and he went to uh, uh, George Raft and he asked him if there was anything he could do to, to help him and, and Raft said I'll, I'll, I'll speak to Oni Madden and, and we'll, we'll get the contract on you removed and, 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 and Cagney was forever grateful to him for that. John, had you ever heard that story before about Cagney? Yeah, yes, I have. And you know, of course, that George Raft uh, uh, was uh, um, good friends with Bugsy Siegel while he was in huh. Hollywood, and, and right, uh, Jeffrey? And, I mean, they were, they were pretty darn good friends, and, and a lot of people didn't like it, but George Raft was pretty loyal. From something I read about George Raft, he... he uh, gave a lot of these guys money and they never even paid him back but he was in no position to say hey where's my money it was just one of those kind of deals but uh that was in the 30s you know if you ever heard that about uh, George Raft and uh, Bugsy Sing I'm sure you 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 read you read something during the ab 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 absolutely they were great friends they, they had met in New York where they hung out with a lot of the same people and uh, but you're right uh if 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 you lent Bugsy Siegel money don't expect to ask for the money to be repaid. Either he will ignore you or shoot you. <laughs> yeah, it was like his friendship was what he repaid you with. That was basically exactly. what it was. You know, huh. like yeah, he, oh. he, he'd do, he would do any favor in the world for you, and including kill someone for you, but he wouldn't part with money. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, and you'd repay I mean, him eventually for that favor. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Gosh. Well, you, you brought up Primo Carnera, and I want to ask you a few, a few questions about that, because I've read some uh, things about him that 
I mean, most of his fights were fixes. I read that. Some of them weren't. They put him in fights where he was obviously the bigger man and everything. Tell me, was there anything about, I mean, we, you know, anybody who knows boxing history and everything knows the Primo story. And, and was there anything about him that while you were doing your research that you discovered and you went, huh, how about that? Well, well, there were um, a, a, a few things. One, he did have an inclination, you know, that he wasn't as good as he as he was led to believe, and he discovered that when Oni Madden uh, hired Abe Attell to to train Primo Carnera for a fight to teach him some of the the more basic elements of, of boxing that that Primo didn't know, and mm. uh, Primo also developed a. Um, a, a, a terrific uh, respect and admiration for uh, Max Baer, who defeated him for the mm-hmm. world championship. Mm-hmm. A- and um, w- w- uh, because Oni Madden and his mob dumped uh, Primo Carnera after he lost the fight to, mm-hmm. to Max Baer. A- and uh, he was badly beaten in that bout. He had a broken jaw, uh, th- three broken ribs, and I think a broken uh, a bone in, in, in one of his arms. Jeez. And, uh, Max Baer felt so responsible for this that he paid all of Oni Madden's hospital bills. And, mm. and when um, Max Baer died, Oni Madden was in Italy and couldn't get to California for the funeral. And, but when he did get to California a week later, he had his driver take him to the cemetery where Max Baer was buried. And it was late mm-hmm. at night and the cemetery gates were closed and he and his driver climbed over the fence of, and, and found Max Baer's uh, gravestone, and um, uh, Mac, uh, 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 Primo, Primo knelt down yeah. Yeah. And, and crossed himself and said a prayer, and when he got up, he said to his driver that Max Baer was the best friend that he ever had in boxing. Oh, wow. Wow. That's incredible. That's like, that doesn't surprise me about Max Bear because he, he had a big heart. And that was the thing Primo showed. You know you know this better than anyone, Jeffrey. I mean, man, Max Bear kept knocking him down, but he kept getting up. Yeah. So you can, yeah. you can say a lot about him, but he had a big heart and his big body. He had a big heart and he had a lot of courage. And, and also uh, uh, Max Bear was the one who arranged for a Primo to have a wrestling career after Oni Madden and his thugs stole all of his money. Wow, wow, great guy, great guy. Is, 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 do you think that's the scene uh, that uh, the, the scene that's in uh, Requiem for a Heavyweight right at the end? Is that based on Primo also? Well, um, uh, uh, refresh my memory uh, about that. that last Anthony, scene. Anthony Quinn, Anthony Quinn's uh, boxing career is over, and uh, Mickey Rooney and Jackie Gleason get him into wrestling, and it, it's actually right. a really sad scene at the end. You know, it's embarrassing for for uh, Anthony Quinn, which uh, I guess Primo kind of thrived in, in that. He made a lot of money as a wrestler. Primo loved it. I, I, I mean, in, in the movie, I, uh, you're right. It, it, he does seem deeply embarrassed by, yeah. by having to uh, put on this act of, of being a wrestler. But, but it appealed to, um, to, to Primo because, you know, before Primo became a boxer, he was a circus strongman, and he used to perform mm-hmm. acts in a circus that uh, he enjoyed doing, and wrestling reminded him of that. Mm-hmm. Okay. Wow. Wow. Okay, let's talk about Mike Jacobs, who, again, if you know boxing history and you know about the people that were running things in those days, he was a, a very interesting, kind of <laughs> not the nicest guy in the world, and uh, nobody got a meaningful fight in boxing as, unless they went through uh, Mike Jacobs, uh, and, and you played by his rules. Who was Mike Jacobs? Give, a, give us a little background on that guy. Well, Mike Jacobs was probably the most unlikable guy in, in, <laughs> in, in, in boxing. Uh, a couple of years ago when I was giving a talk about my Max Bear Barney Ross book, uh, uh, Mike Jacobs' niece uh, uh, came to hear me. And afterwards she said to me, you know, none of his relatives liked him. <laughs> they all disliked <laughs> him. They thought he was a miserable person. <laughs> ah. well, which I found very amusing, but 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 he was a guy who who came out of real dire poverty. He he was very clever at putting together deals. Um, he, he began selling newspapers on the street and, and and then selling candy to people going on on boat excursion trips. Uh, he worked himself up and and was pr- promoting uh, 
uh, events at, uh, at Madison Square Garden and, and eventually got himself into uh, boxing promotions. And he was, uh, he was a friend of Damon Runyon. Uh, and at one point, they actually had a, uh, a company with, with a third partner. And at, they were making so much money that uh, Mike Jacobs, who was very greedy, wound up pushing uh, Damon Runyon and the other partner out of the business and, and, and took it over himself. And he made a deal also with uh, Madison Square Garden and uh, Joe Lewis that he would get uh, 10% of all of uh, Joe Lewis's earnings as long as Joe Lewis remained the heavyweight champion. Yeah, yeah, he, he was something else. And, and, and what a, you know... He wasn't pushed out of boxing until after he had a couple of strokes, and then Frankie yeah. Carbo came in and, and, and took over what Mike Jacobs had been doing and, 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 and made it really corrupt on a much larger level. Hmm. Fascinating. What about Jacobs Beach, Jeffrey? Tell us about that. What was it? Well, th th that was a, a little store, actually, th th where, out of which Mike uh, Jacobs operated, and, and all these uh, uh, boxers and promoters – would always be hanging around in, in, in front of the place. And I think it was Damon Runyon who said it was, it was like a, a beach out there, and, and, it, and mm. it became known as Jacob's Beach. And what it really was was just a little ticket store on the west side of uh, Manhattan, just west of Broadway. Hmm. Uh, <laughs> we, uh, you know, uh, we had uh, Angelo Dundee on this show uh, about three years ago, and one of the stories he told us, I, I asked him if he ever ran into any of these, these wise guy types, and he said, he said, yeah, yeah, yeah. He said, I was in an elevator in Florida, and the guy who got in the elevator with me was Frankie Carbo, and he said, I knew who he was because I'd seen him at the fights, and I'd seen his picture in the paper and stuff, so we're riding up the elevator, and I looked at him, and I said, hey, I know you for somewhere, don't I? And he said, Carbo looked at him with these shark eyes and said, you don't know me. <laughs> <laughs> and that was the end of it. Um, so oh. Oh, along comes Carbo. Uh, he was part of Murder Incorporated. Uh, yes, yeah, supposedly he killed about 19 people as a member of Murder Incorporated. Wow. And and actually was convicted one time, right, C cab driver? He was convicted of, of killing a taxi driver from whom he tried to uh, – uh, get money for a protection racket that he was running, and the uh, taxi driver wouldn't go along with it, so he just shot him. So they sent him to Sing Sing, and how long did he spend there? A couple of years, I think it was, and he, yeah. he was a very he was a model prisoner, and he got out after a, a, a shorter period of time for good behavior. M uh, Murder and, and, Incorporated and, was was essentially an association of hitmen for hire, right? Yeah, there were there were about a hundred uh, members of it. It, it was a, a hit team uh, th that was run by uh, two gangsters, uh, Albert Anastasia and uh, Lepke Bulk Buckhalter. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, Lepke Buckhalter was eventually convicted of, uh, of, of ordering the, the hit on a number of different people. And he was the only organized crime boss in the history of organized crime who was electrocuted uh, uh, in the electric wow. chair at Sing Sing Prison. No kidding. Wow. 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 So okay. So so Jacobs has a, a cerebral hemorrhage. He's the guy running boxing. So and that's when Carbo swooped in, right? And and kind of right. took over the boxing world. Right. Um, yeah. Uh, Carbo was also looking around for for something that where he could make a lot of money very quickly, and uh, you know he had been involved in continued to be involved in hits even after he. He took over boxing. There were the um, the uh, one of the mafia bosses of, of New Jersey, a man named Ralph Natale, uh, reported that it was well known in mafia circles that uh, Frankie Carbo was the one who actually shot and killed Bugsy Siegel. Mm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wow. And 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 yet Bugsy Siegel and and and, and Frankie Carbo had been involved together in Murder Incorporated, almost as partners, where they committed a lot of murders themselves so carbo kind of ruled boxing uh in a way different way than, than jacobs did he he did it through fear and intimidation right absolutely yeah i, I mean it, it, jacobs didn't have that capacity to to intimidate people he he was very deceptive 
and, and manipulative, but but Carbo was very direct, and and he worked with uh, uh, a man named uh, uh, Frank Blinky Palermo, and 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 the two of them, uh, you, know, you know, could scare you to death. Uh, if if you didn't go along with them, they threatened to uh, rip your eyes out, to to bat, batter your head down with a baseball bat. Uh, to do anything they could to get you to sign a contract. Uh, and one of the guys who didn't go along with him, stood up to him, uh, was was the the great trainer Ray Arcel. What happened to him? Yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, uh, Frankie Carbo and uh, a man named Jim Norris, who uh, had an ownership position at Madison Square Garden at that time, were, were the uh, ones who were really producing the Friday night fights in New York, and also the Wednesday night fights. Now, Ray Arcel, who had been a very good trainer, uh, decided that he would produce uh, televised fights, though his would come from Boston on Saturday night. And uh, uh, Frankie Carbo's minions went uh, to Ray Arcel and said, you can't do this, you've got to stop, and he refused to do it refused to go along with them, and then they threatened to kill him. And he didn't believe it. Uh, he just kept doing it. And then uh, one night on his way to the Boston Arena uh, for a, to see one of his fighters, a guy came up behind him with a, a lead pipe wrapped in a newspaper and hit him over the head and fractured his skull. And, and he almost died. He was in the hospital for several weeks. But he got the message, and he quit boxing, for I think it was 17 or 18 years until um, Roberto Duran's uh, manager begged him to become Roberto Duran's uh, a trainer. And, 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 and he, he did that without getting paid. He didn't want to get paid. Wow. He, 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 he did it because he just wanted to get back in the game. And, and I might be backing up a few years too, but uh, something similar happened to Benny Leonard, right? Well, um, Benny Leonard lost all of his money um, in, in, in the Depression and, and had to go back to fighting. And he, he was mm -hmm. really kind of old and washed up by then. And, you know, he had been a great fighter before then and, and took a lot of terrible beatings. But then to, to make money, he also had to become a referee. And, mm -hmm. um, and, and I, I think it was in 1947 or so around then that, that – uh, while refereeing a boxing match in Queens, uh, New York, uh, he dropped dead uh, in the ring of a yeah. heart attack. Exactly. Mm. Yeah. Okay. okay. Yeah. Um, one of the most infamous fixed fights, and and we all saw it uh, depicted in Raging Bull, was when Jake LaMotta uh, took a, a really a less convincing than convincing dive against Billy Fox. Uh, right. It was something he did to set himself up for a world title shot. That had been out of reach to him previously because of this this culture that where you know the mob ran everything. Tell the story of Lamada versus Fox. Well, well, you know everyone thought that Jake Lamada w w should have been the middleweight boxing champion. He, you know he was one of the toughest uh, ring opponents around. And uh, but if you wanted to get a title fight at Madison Square Garden, you had to sign on with uh, uh, Frankie Carpo and, and Frank Palermo. And he didn't want to do that. You know, he knew a lot of mob guys, and he associated with a lot of mob guys, but he knew that if he signed on with them, that they would own him. And he didn't want to be owned by anybody. He wanted to be his own person. And he continued fighting, and he fought out of New York and, and in club fights and all over the place. But they, they wouldn't give him a title bout. And um, finally, he got so disgusted uh, uh, that he, he agreed with, with uh, Frankie Carpo to um, – to, to take a dive in a, in a fight with uh, Billy Fox. And, um, and, and Frankie Carbo said, look, you want to make a lot of money on this fight, bet, bet uh, against yourself, bet for Billy Fox. And he did. He, he, I, I can't remember if it was uh, $100,000, I, I think, that he bet. Um, and, and, and he really cleaned up on that. But then he had to have uh, four or five additional fights before Carbo would give him a shot at the title. And, and then he, he fought Marcel Serdan and, and won that fight and, and became the middleweight championship, the middleweight champ. But he, 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 he was not a nice guy. I, I mean, I, I recently was speaking to uh, Rocky Graziano's daughter, and uh, she told me 
that uh, uh, Jake would often come and visit them, and uh, her mother couldn't stand Jake. She just thought he, he was a lousy human being and didn't want to have anything to do with him. But her father, Rocky Graziano, uh, loved Jake. They had been friends since they met in reform school when they were uh, mm-hmm. teenagers. And mm-hmm. often uh, Jake was looking for opportunities to make money. And since Rocky was having a very successful career in television, he often got uh, Jake parts in movies and on TV programs, for which uh, Jake was very grateful. Wow. Hey, Jeffrey, since you read that book about Rocky Graziano and you know a little bit about Jake LaMotta, too, I've got to ask you, they almost fought once. Uh, and I think an injury canceled that one. If they had ever fought each other, Jake LaMotta and Rocky Graziano, who do you think would have won? I think Jake would have. Mm-hmm. But, yeah. but I think it would have been really close. Uh, um, it, it would have been very difficult, I think, I think for not so much for Jake, but I think it would have been very difficult for Rocky uh, to, to fight Jake because he liked him so much. And, and, and there were a couple of cases where, where, where Rocky went easy, on other opponents whom he liked. I mean, he would win, but but he wouldn't go all out and 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 try to kill them the way he did in some of his bouts. Yeah, yeah. That one would have been bloody oh. though. Oh baby. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, sure. Yeah. Well, you mentioned this guy a little bit, and I want to talk a little bit more about. I want you to talk a little bit about him. Uh, the infamous Blinky Palermo, uh, another charming associate of Frankie Carbo. Tell us a little bit more about Blinky. How did he? Uh, did he know how I've, I forgot now or I forget, but he, he was associated with Frankie Carbo, obviously. But how did he weasel his way into and become like uh, Carbo's right hand man? Well, he, he started out, he was known as the um, numbers king of, uh, of, of Philadelphia. And, and mm. he was um, a member of, of the uh, Philadelphia mob family. And, and, and they had a lot of associations with, with various New York mob families. And, um, he uh, owned a. Uh, he also owned a boxing gym, I believe, in Philadelphia, and and he owned uh, some uh, uh, boxers, and and uh, he wanted th- those boxers to go on and become uh, uh, champs as well, and and have title fights, and it 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 was just a uh, a, a thing where these two guys' interests coalesced, and uh, they found that they could benefit each other. And um, and and also uh, b- because um, Frankie Carbo had a criminal record, he couldn't be licensed in in New York as a manager, and he needed front people uh, uh, to manage for him. And uh, initially, uh, Palermo was able to do that, and then there was another a, a guy from Pennsylvania named um, Jaime the Mink Wallman. Uh, mm-hmm. His name was. Who, who was also a, a manager. And it's very interesting. I had a friend uh, a number of years ago. He's a, he's a retired stockbroker, and he and his brother uh, were the managers of an up-and-coming middleweight uh, in, in the 1980s. And um, they had a, a small training camp in, in Pennsylvania, and uh, their their fighter was sparring with, with an opponent there. And, and one day, uh, uh, Frank Palermo and... Jaime Waldman arrived at the training camp, and, and they said to, to them, in effect, he's no longer your fighter, he's our fighter. Uh-huh. And, and, mm. and, and, with, and with a few threats, they, they, they took the fighter away from him. Palermo was a mm. little guy, right? He was only a little over five feet tall. Was he, yeah, he was maybe five feet two, but, but he was a menace. <laughs> was he a leg and, breaker? And, and, was, he, was he a killer? Was he anything like yeah, that? Yeah, uh, he, he, he had a very violent temper. He couldn't hmm. control it, and and you know it, it was, he was like a mad dog in a way. So you know, a, a mad dog can be a, you know a small little dog, but it can still take a you know a, quite a bite out of your leg. The, the Joe the, the Joe Pesci character. Yeah, yeah, look at Joe Pesci, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. About the same size, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. You know, uh, I, I thought of this question when Dennis and I were talking about what to ask you, and, and I know that uh, – I think I remember that Carbo was – Frankie Carbo was involved with uh, Johnny Saxon in the 19, uh, late 40s and 50s. He, he, one of them – I'm not sure which one of them stole his, his contract away and, 
and set up Saxon for uh, some of his fights uh, uh, with uh, uh, Carmen Basilio and things like that. But this question is about, this is a kind of a hard one, but I'm curious with all your research and all you know about boxing, Jeffrey, if you could give like a ballpark figure of how many fights you think uh, Carbo and Palermo were able to fix in the 40s and 50s. Gee, gee, I don't, I, you know, I would, I would just be taking a guess, but, but I yeah, would guess, you know, somewhere around 30 fights. Mm. Okay. Huh? And, and, yeah. and uh, you know, Frankie Palermo owned the contract on, on Saxton. That's right. That's right, yeah. And they pretty much discarded him after he lost the third fight to, to Basilio, and his life was just just terrible. Uh, awful. And these just, guys just didn't awful. care. Yeah, yeah. these guys what, didn't what? care, right? We just, like, discarded him. Yeah, uh, you, you know, it, 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 you saw that with, with uh, Primo Carnera and and right. and, and Saxton and others, uh, and Billy Fox. Um, you know, as, as soon as these guys could no longer uh, turn a buck for them, they became useless and they were discarded. Wow. You know, they were thrown away like a used tissue. Yeah. Hmm. This is the Ringside Boxing Show from Monterey, California. I'm Dennis Taylor with John J. Responti. We're talking to Jeffrey Sussman whose brand-new book is Boxing in the Mob, The Notorious History of the Sweet Science. Um, okay, so uh, John and I have a mutual friend, Carl Sigmund, who hung out at the, at the Olympic uh, for a while uh, when he lived in L.A., and he gave me this little snapshot of ringside, and sitting right, at, right on the ring apron is Mickey Cohen. Um, what, what about <laughs> Mickey Cohen and, and Bugsy Siegel? Um, how involved were they in, in boxing underworld? Well, well you know, Mickey Cohn started out as a boxer uh, mm-hmm. in Chicago, right. a- a- and um, you know, eventually he had to leave Chicago uh, because his criminal criminality was catching up with him. And um, w- when uh, Bugsy Siegel was, was sent out to Los Angeles to run uh, the racing wire and 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 and, and gambling out there, uh, he, he needed a uh, an, 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 an assistant, in effect, and. Um, Mickey Cohn, who, who was a, a, a terrific thug, uh, appealed to, to, to Bugsy Siegel. And uh, when Bugsy Siegel needed someone threatened or needed uh, some, someone to take care of something for him, uh, he called on, on Mickey Cohn to do it. Mickey Cohn mm-hmm. supposedly threatened the life of, uh, of, uh, of, of Jack Dragna, who, who was head of the mob in Los Angeles, before uh, Bugsy Siegel got there. Mm-hmm. Jeez. Um, so, so Jeffrey, you're a, a New York native. Um, as, as a younger person, how aware were you of wise guy mafia underworld people in, in that city? Um, how, how did um, were those guys intimidated, intimidating thugs um, in your day when you were growing up? Were they local bad boy celebrities? Were they envied for their wealth and power and pretty women and and respect they evoked uh, because they were feared? Or, or were they just I, 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 I think all of that is true. Um, my, um, other than meeting uh, my father's uncle Irving, um, th- th- my other encounter with, with a, 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 a gangster who was very powerful at the time, I, I used to work for my father on Saturday mornings. My father had a, uh, a garment factory, and he used to take me there on Saturday mornings when I would uh, sweep up the floor and I would carry bolts of cloth up from the basement to what was called a cutter's table where they would be unrolled and, and patterns would be cut for ladies' dresses. I was coming up from the basement uh, one Saturday morning carrying uh, a bolt of cloth on my shoulder, and I hear my father who, who, and another man screaming and yelling at each other. And when I got up uh, to where the cutter's table was, I, I looked down, and, and, I, and I saw these two men. They looked as if they were coming to blows. My father's fists were clenched. He, he had one fist raised like he was going to throw a punch. And uh, when he shouted at this guy, a spittle came out of his mouth. And then the guy pointed at my father and, and he said, we're going to get you, you son of a bitch. And he, uh, and he left. Mm-hmm. And I asked my father on the way home uh, what that was all about. And he said, that was a notorious uh, New York gangster named uh, Johnny Dio who controlled mm-hmm. uh, illegal unions and uh, the trucking business uh, in in uh, New York, and he um, wanted to unionize my father's workers, and the the workers voted against unionization because they would have wound up getting less pay uh, than 
and if they had uh, stayed uh, union free. And they all, uh, Johnny Dio also wanted my uh, father to use his uh, trucking company. And um, mm. uh, so, so uh, about a week later, my parents had uh, taken me out for dinner to celebrate my birthday. And when we got home uh, later that evening, our home had been broken into, and everything in the kitchen was, was smashed. You know, they, they emptied the refrigerator and they threw fruit against the wall, and they they poured out containers of milk, and it, the place looked like a mess. And mm-hmm. um, I, I discovered later on uh, from a, uh, a, a policeman neighbor of ours that uh, th- this had been a message from uh, 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 Johnny Dio that we uh, that my father better go along, or this was just the beginning. Of, of 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 what he would face, and uh, my mother had a uh, a cousin who uh, had some uh, mob connections. He was sort of a a shady kind of character, and uh, he he was able to negotiate a uh, a deal between my father and Johnny Dio's trucking company, so there was no f- uh, further acts of violence. But uh, th- th- that that was. Uh, a, a real eye opener for me uh, in 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 how um, uh, the mob operated. And you were like wow. 13, 14 years old when that happened, right? That must have been right. chilling. Yeah, it was. Um, I, I, I I I was stunned by it. I, I you know I just stood there speechless. Wow, what a story! Back in those days, if somebody went to a fight at Madison Square Garden, Jeffrey, were they likely to see those wise guys? I mean, were they sitting right there and easy to spot? Oh, yeah, I think so, definitely. You know, I I was talking about four weeks ago to uh, uh, Jerry Cooney, and he he liked my book very much, and and, and he said, uh, you know, boxing and the mob, the two always went together. Mm. You know, they were always interchangeable, especially in New York. Yeah, yeah. Wow. Uh, Sonny Liston was always viewed as a a mob-connected fighter. Uh, Both of his losses to Ali, uh, the former Cassius Clay, were were viewed as suspicious. The first one because uh, of the liniment-type substance that that, uh, Clay somehow got into his eyes, especially the, the second fight, the Phantom Punch fight. Uh, with the with the shady knockout, what's your opinion of uh, the level of the mob's influence on Sonny Liston, and what do you think happened in the in the Phantom Punch fight? I I, I think that uh, Sonny Liston was controlled by the mob ever since he was uh, a late teenager, eighteen or nineteen years old. Um, that, that that was his life. Um, in, in 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 the in the first fight, I I I, I think he was prepared to take a dive. Uh, but he did seriously injure uh, his, his arm because it was examined afterwards, and they discovered that uh, he had bled into the muscles uh, in, in, in his upper arm and, and in his uh, forearm, and, and, and that's why he really couldn't move it. In, 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 the, in the second fight, the one with the phantom punch, uh, a, a gangster uh, from Ohio uh, named John Vitale, uh, who owned a piece of uh, Sonny Liston, told a friend – don't bother going up to, uh, to 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 Lewiston to see the fight because it'll be over before you get there. Mm-hmm. And um, and a uh, a gambler in Las Vegas named Ash Resnick, who was a friend of uh, Sonny Liston and also owned a piece of Sonny Liston, when a friend of his said that he wanted to fly up to uh, Lewiston, Maine, to see the fight, um, Ash Resnick said almost the same thing that John Vitale said. He 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 just said. Uh, uh, the fight will be over in the first round. It's not worth your going there. Wow. Uh, Man. Uh, and, 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 you know, when, when Ollie was standing over Sonny Liston, uh, who was rolling around on the canvas before he finally lay down flat on his back, he, he looked over at Sonny Liston and he said, get up, sucker. No one's going to believe this. No one's no going to believe, believe it. Yeah. And, and, and then when Ollie got back to his corner, he said to his cornerman, did I hit him? I don't think I hit him. Did I hit him? Hmm. Ah, really? Wow. Oh. <laughs> Great stuff. So, so, you know, I don't think Ollie was in on any of this, but but he was furious that that it made him look like a fool. Yeah. Uh, our, our late great friend, Don Chargan, the legendary promoter, um, was uh, one of those people.
people who testified uh, about the mob's influence of the, of the, on the sport. Um, and he told us that it was it was really a frightening experience. And you know, the guys who who didn't uh, play ball got the hell beat out of them, like Ray Arcel. Um, right. And there were many others. Um, what did it take to ultimately break the underworld's grip on the sport? Well, well, I, I think that um, when um, Robert Kennedy prosecuted um, Frankie Carpo and Frank Palermo and Jim Norris and 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 some others, uh, he 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 sent a very strong message, you know, you know that you, you guys can't do this anymore. You, you know, we're, we're going to be watching you very carefully, and. Uh, and I think it changed the way that the mob thought of themselves as possibly being interested in 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 boxing. There was an interesting testimony that I have in my book by um, Sammy Gravano to a uh, Senate committee investigating corruption in boxing in 1993. And he said that if the mob were to get involved in boxing again, they would wind up probably owning the manager and the fighter would never even know th- that uh, – that his manager was owned by the mob and 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 they would build up a fighter by making sure that he had opponents that he could easily beat and then when it came time to getting him ranked let's say as a contender they would go to one of the sanctioning bodies and and pay them to 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 uh rank their their man as as a, as a number one contender he he said at one point he did that and I forgot which sanctioning body it was, and they wanted $10,000 to, uh, uh, to rank this fighter as the number one contender. And when Sammy Gravano mentioned John Gotti's name, the sanctioning body said, well, as a courtesy, we'll, we'll lower the fee to $5,000. Mm-hmm. And, um, and, and, and then he said, you know, th- th- these championship bouts, you know, they're worth tens and tens of millions of dollars. And, 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 and that's where the real money lies in. You know the, tel- the television rights, the movie rights, whatever r- rights they can sell uh, nationally and internationally are, are worth a lot more to them than uh, fixing a fight, which is what used to go down in the old days. Uh, and and it, it almost didn't matter who won the fight uh, because of all the money involved. Mm, interesting. Was there anything that just when you were doing your research that really surprised you, Jeffrey, where you went, wow, that, that is really amazing stuff? Um, it, 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 it surprised me th- that um, some people uh, uh, were, were treated uh, so, so badly. Um, mm. uh, th- there, there were a, a number of uh, fighters who were forced, who were really good fighters, who were forced to um, – to lose, and then their careers ended, and and, and they didn't get anything. They, they were abandoned. Um, mm. th- th- there was a a fighter who uh, beat Rocky Graziano twice in the 1940s. His name was Steve Riggio, and mm. and you, you would have thought he would have gone on to have a great career, and instead he wound up as a taxi driver uh, after he had the, these wins against Rocky Graziano. And his sons, by the way, are the ones who uh, own and operate uh, the Barnes & Noble bookstores. Mm. Wow. wow. Really? Okay. <laughs> yeah. And, and, and then there was another fighter um, named uh, Henry Green who beat Rocky twice and then lost the mm-hmm. third time. And he claimed that, that mm-hmm. he was forced to lose the third time, you know, that, that he better lose or else. And that was the fight. Wasn't that the fight where he got stopped in like the tenth round or something like that? Where Rocky stopped him in the tenth round. Harold Green, right? I think that Third was fight. The one. You, yeah. That's it. Yeah. And, How and, much and, and that? then. Go ahead. I'm sorry. I, I said go ahead. Oh, and, and then there was there was a guy named um, Harry Haft, uh, and they're making a movie about him right now. Um, he he was a. Uh, it's a fascinating story. He was uh, a prisoner in a World War II concentration camp, and he was forced to fight for the entertainment of the uh, SS guards. And he won something like 70 fights uh, in, a, in a concentration camp. And he came to New York after World War II, and he started having a, a successful career uh, as a heavyweight boxer. And he was scheduled to uh, fight uh, Rocky Marciano, and um, two uh, thugs came into his dressing room before the fight and, and told him he better lose or we're going to kill you. Mm. 
and, yeah. and, and, and yeah. he lost, and that, that was the end of his fight career. How much of that kind of thing, uh, if any, you know, the, the obviously the mob is receded back into the shadows in, in a sense, and they, but do you suspect that they could be involved in in, in some of the uh, some part of of boxing uh, even today? Sure. Yeah. Really. Uh, but 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 I think it'll it'll be hidden. It'll be very circumspect. Right. Uh, right. You know, they, 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 don't, they certainly don't want anyone shining a spotlight on them. Yeah, exactly. That's what I mean when I said they've they've gone back in the shadows. Where they would be involved in the money aspect, right? Some in some some shadowy way. Is that what you're thinking? Yeah, I, I mean, you know, that's what attracts the mob is is, is the money. It, it, it's yeah. uh, it, it, it 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 it's not the sport so much. But 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 it's also interesting to to see how many different mob guys uh, started out as boxers. Yeah, and how many of them liked boxing? I mean, I know Al Capone really liked boxing, and he was somewhat some, kind of friends with Jack Dempsey. And he, day, he was so. a very good friend of uh, of Barney Ross. He helped to to uh, begin Barney Ross's career as a young man. He he hired a trainer right. for him, and, and 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 made sure that all the uh, tickets uh, for the fight were sold, and that Barney Ross got a portion of that. That's right. That was in your book. Yeah, yeah. It was, right. it was interesting stuff. Yeah. Who in this rogues gallery was was Bobby Kennedy able to send to prison? Uh, uh, Frankie Carbo went to prison for 25 years, and uh, Frank Palermo for 15 years. Mm. Uh, okay. Um, wow. How much do you enjoy? Did you enjoy researching this book? It must have been a lot of fun. Really. Interesting. Oh, I loved doing it. It, it. it was fascinating reading this, and what was also fascinating was reading the uh, the FBI files on uh, on Frankie Carbo and Frank Palermo. I mean, they were enormous, and, and, and the number of crimes that they were suspected of, it, it, it was staggering. Gosh. And, and, and what's also interesting is, is to read the, the FBI file on the last Ali fight. The FBI also said that, that that last fight was fixed, the one with the phantom punch. Really? <laughs> yeah. There you go. Yeah, that would be interesting <laughs> stuff. Wow. Well, uh, I always like to ask a writer what the what the next project is. Man, I think if I were you... Uh, I, I'd never, you know, I, I don't think there's ever been a, a, a great movie made about Carbo and Palermo and, you know, Jacobs and all these guys uh, in a boxing context, has there? Have, Not that I'm aware of, no. Play? Yeah, might be a screenplay for you, man. Uh, uh, if, 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 if you know anyone who's interested, let me know. <laughs> okay. I'll write it. <laughs> we'll keep our ears yeah. open. <laughs> if, if, yeah. if you want to produce it, I'll write it. All right. We're on it. <laughs> yeah, John and I are just rolling in dough. We'll be executive producer. Yes, right. <laughs> you know how this uh, this bestseller author stuff works out. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so, all right, John, got anything else? Uh, no, not really. I, you know, I did okay. think of something just for, just real quickly. I, I wanted to add something about my dad. You know, you were talking about the mob, and, you know, my, my family was very uh, involved uh, in a way. When you were telling that incredible story about your father, my dad also knew knew of the mob very well. And the thing that he told me that was really fascinating was they noticed two things immediately about the mob, their shoes and their cars. And, you know, we're talking about very, very poor kids, and they were so fascinated by that. And then uh, later on when my dad was a little older, uh, uh, something happened that was a little more violent, and that brought, it to the, brought him to the reality of the situation, which sounds like exactly what you experienced with your father. Right, right. Yes, it, 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 it's amazing what they will do in order to, uh, to accomplish their goals. Exactly, ruthless. Absolutely you, ruthless. Were you a big fan of the the Sopranos and Goodfellas and all that kind of stuff? Yes, I was. Um, uh, years ago, I I, uh, I had a friend who who was deceased now. He was a doctor, and he I learned a lot of fascinating things from him. His father was a professional gambler who controlled uh, gambling in New York for the uh, for the gangster uh, Frank Costello. And mm. and Frank Frank Costello was my friend's godfather when he was growing up, oh and God. and uh, this friend of mine had an opportunity to to go into the mob, and he chose not to. Uh, he it, it wasn't for him, and you know he eventually became a doctor. 
but um, he, he he told me that um, t- t- two interesting stories that were like scenes out of a movie. When when he grad- when he was in high school, his father and Frank Costello uh, showed up one day after class in this big, uh, very expensive uh, Cadillac, and uh, they took him up to Saratoga, where the races take place every year, and and which is a, a tremendous mob hangout. And, and they gave him uh, two or three thousand dollars to bet as he liked uh, on, on, on the horses, and he said that was fascinating. And the other experience he had was that um, when he graduated from high school, he wanted to take his date to the uh, to the prom, and then he wanted to take her out to uh, the Copacabana nightclub, which was a, a mob-owned nightclub. It was owned, in fact, by Frank Costello. And he called uh, uh, Frank Costello and, and asked him if he could have a reservation uh, for that night at the uh, Copacabana. And uh, uh, Frank arranged it. He got a table right in front of the stage uh, that night, and um, a dinner and drinks w- were on the house for him. And he got to hear uh, a young Frank Sinatra performing uh, th- that mm-hmm. night at the Copacabana. Uh, so those are the two stories that he told me that I found uh uh, fascinating about uh, amazing, yeah, man. Uh, th- th- there, there had to be perks to knowing a guy like Frank Costello. But at the same time, I wonder how much mental baggage it is to go through life uh, realizing that your godfather is probably burning in hell right now. Well, you know what was well, what was also in, what was also interesting for him is because his father controlled gambling in New York for Frank Costello, his father became uh, 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 very good friends with uh, Abe Battelle. Uh, and and, and uh, his, his, he told me that his father took him to uh, Abe Battelle's funeral when I think Abe Battelle was 72 years old when he died. Hmm. Wow. Wow. Incredible well, stuff. Uh, man, you chose a fascinating topic uh, that is an important part of the history of the sport that we all love. Uh, great job on the book, Jeffrey. We hope you sell a, yes. a zillion copies um, because this is a really worthy read for any boxing fan or history buff. And uh, thanks a bunch for making some time for us today on the Inside Boxing Show. Always a pleasure. Thank well, thank you, thank you for having me. I always enjoy speaking with you guys, and, uh, and you're a pair of wonderful interviewers. Hey, thanks, man. Appreciate it. Thanks. Jeffrey Sussman is the author of Boxing and the Mob, The Notorious History of the Sweet Science. It's published by Roman and Littlefield, and you can order it from Amazon or Barnes & Noble or most any other place uh, where books are sold. Um, it uh, officially comes out Wednesday, right, Jeffrey? That's right, May 8th. May 8th, Wednesday, great. May 8th. Okay, thanks, Jeffrey. Have a great one. Same to you. Yeah, take, take care. Take care. Bye-bye. All right. Uh, hey, do you like the Ringside Boxing Show? Do us a solid and tell other boxing fans about this podcast. Help us grow. Also, if you haven't yet discovered the number one website in the world for daily boxing news, you got something to do right this minute. Uh, visit ringsideboxingshow.com, and you'll find the biggest headlines and the best stories 365 days a year. This should be your first stop every morning, and it might be the only boxing site you need to visit to get your daily boxing fix uh, all day long, ringsideboxingshow.com. We want to thank our expert analyst, Travis Hartman, Rizwan Zahid, and my partner here, John J. Responsi, for their weekly contributions to this show, as well as our outstanding British correspondent, Paul McLaughlin. And, of course, another huge thanks to today's featured guest, Jeffrey Sussman, author of Boxing in the Mob, The Notorious History of the Sweet Science. Outstanding book. Pick it up. Um, as always, we want to thank you, Ringside Nation, for being a part of our worldwide audience again today. Keep your chin tucked. We'll talk to you again next week on the Ringside Boxing Show. Well, it's a great day for me to whoop somebody's ass. It's a bad day, so you better get off of my back. You might get cold, cock. If you cross my path, this is a great day.